<laughs> so I want to welcome Dr. Andrew Grinnell. Um, he is a clinical exercise physiologist and completed his PhD in postdoctoral training at UCD, um, where he focused on body composition and appetite control in people with obesity. His 10 years clinical um, experience working with people living with obesity um, has focused on helping um, them gain health through holistic lifestyle support um, in the community. So I'm very happy to welcome Andy. Uh, if you want to take it away. Um, can you hear me okay there? Thank God, we can. <laughs> Thanks very much for the invitation, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to share some of my perspectives on how we should be thinking about exercise therapy and obesity treatment. And I just want to emphasize from the get-go that the message in this slide deck is not about preventing obesity. Um, but we have made a lot of progress in the last 10 years around treatment, a lot of breakthroughs. But as you've heard from speakers this morning, what's been lagging very far behind is how society thinks about this disease. Um, so it's no doubt about it, progress starts with changing the narrative and it starts with events like today. So before kind of jumping in, I just want to cover a few fundamental concepts related to obesity care. So first, you've heard from um, Professor O'Shea and Dr. Crowley, there's clear evidence this is a, a chronic disease Next, what's very important and very relevant is um, this year's CDD meeting which had the head on is making a differentiation between what is the societal view of weight loss. So this concept is very linked to the social pressure to be thin and be alert. It's framed in the short term. It's often a goal of people not living with obesity. It's something that we all experience. Think weddings, summer holidays, New Year's resolutions. This is very different to uh, obesity treatment, which is compassionate, non-stigmatizing, long-term evidence-based care. And when we think about responding to treatment, what does that mean? It, it, it means mechanistically addressing underlying root causes and the biology of the disease. And why people respond is extremely complex. It's biopsychosocial social being environmental, but there's no doubt about it, we have grossly underappreciated the environmental and biological side. And what I'm going to um, argue in my presentation is that because exercise is not addressing the underlying pathophysiology for most people, we need to reframe but not eliminate its role in the treatment experience. So I'm gonna take us on a short journey through history to kind of understand where beliefs about exercise and weight loss have come from, how they've evolved over time. So we're gonna go back to Hippocrates. So over 2000 years ago, this guy was quite smart. He, he gave us one of the central tenets of medicine, do no harm. Ironically, he also said that for people to lose weight, they should eat only once a day, take no baths, sleep on a hard bed and walk naked as long as possible. So the reality is, of course, that obesity was not very pre prevalent 2000 years ago. It did exist um, and it did, wasn't too prevalent up until the, uh, you know, the pre-industrial revolution. During this time, the environment wasn't very obesogenic, but things obviously started to change and the environment started to change. It became a little bit more obesogenic and in response to growing sedentariness at this time, the physical culture started to emerge and people started to become aware of the need for improving their lifestyle for health. But as the 20th century was approaching, you know, slowly but surely obesity was starting to show its head. And the motivation for many people became weight loss. And as a result, you know, many uh, beliefs about exercise and weight loss that uh, took root continue to this day. And we can understand how these um, beliefs um, evolved by looking at the popularization of calorie counting, which was brought into the mainstream by the very first um, best-selling diet book written by this woman, Dr. Lulu Peters in 1918. So something we still see to this day, she wrote this book based on a sample size of N equals one, one being herself. And what she did was she gave a very deliberate moral dimension to body weight. She said it was an indication of self-esteem, and self-control. But if we move ahead about 50 years later into the 70s, what we started to see was further cultural evolution of these ideas and the commercialization of fitness and the commercialization of dieting. 
And what's important for this story is that at this time, three realities had really emerged in society. One was this strong cultural desire to be thin, two, weight stigma and discrimination, and three, the disease of obesity. And these realities have not gone away. If anything, weight stigma is worse, uh, and the understanding of obesity in the general public remains less than satisfactory. And when we think about stigma, the harm of it can't be underestimated because if it's embedded into society's mind that obesity is caused by laziness and a lack of willpower, your inversion of reasoning is going to be to shame people living with obesity and beat them with a the stick as they exercise. And that's exactly what we've seen portrayed on TV shows like The Biggest Loser and some spin-offs of this concept we've seen in Ireland. And it's also the core ingredient of many uh, commercial weight loss products. So um, boot camps and slimming clubs, they're all framed around the narrative that this is just willpower. So if we stick with the theme of exercise, you know, a question to ask is, do these uh, beliefs such as the one I've just described, are they occurring in healthcare? And the answer is a strong yes. So this is a study which explored the beliefs of patients with obesity, healthcare providers and employers regarding the disease. And in this specific table, we can see data related to beliefs around barriers to initiating a weight loss effort. What we see here is that 87%, that's nine out of 10 HCPs, they felt that a lack of exercise was the biggest reason why people with obesity were not losing weight. So this shouldn't be surprising because this is what patients have been experiencing for decades. Um, from childhood into adult life, they hear it from GPs, nurses, orthopedic surgeons, and so on, and they still do to this day. In a study we did in Dublin, we, we asked patients with severe and complex obesity who were referred to a specialist um, uh, center about their, their beliefs. And what we found is most believed exercise was essential for weight loss. And what was striking was that those who have this belief, they were more likely, when we did correlation analysis, they were more likely to think their obesity was their fault and that it was not a disease. So these beliefs about obesity, exercise, eating less, they're deeply ingrained into the average person's mind. And I think this quote from philosopher Daniel Dennett tells us a lot about why it's so hard to change beliefs because people have a particular personal authority about the nature of their own conscious experience that can trump any hypothesis they find unacceptable. And if we think about it, the nature of the average person's conscious experience, it feels like body weight is easily controllable. It's what we've been told. And it's just an unacceptable hypothesis to question the traditional approaches. But we have tested these hypotheses again and again and again. So the next stop is to look at the data. So the first data to look at is what happens if we attempt to treat obesity with just high volumes of aerobic exercise. So we've got a tremendous amount of meta-analyses on this. Body weight's reduced on average by about 1.5 to 3.5 kilograms. So this is substantially lower than what you'd expect if energy balance was like algebra or bookkeeping, which it's not. There are biological reasons for this limited effect. Um, but if we take a step back and think about how exercise has typically been framed, you know, it's perceived by HCPs, patients, the general public as an essential tool. And what I'll say is, yes, it does drive a bit of weight loss, but this is not clinically significant weight loss for someone with obesity. And the effect is actually not durable in the long term, as we've heard. So what you're seeing on the screen here, this is what's called a waterfall plot from a study where people did people with obesity did 60 high volume aerobic exercise sessions over the course of 12 weeks. And they continued with every aspect of their life as normal. Again, we see average weight loss, three kilograms. We see some people gain weight. We see some people lose no weight. Many lose a little bit and a rare few lose a lot. So biology can explain everything here. And this is because exercise, what we've, we're starting to see, is it has specific actions on several aspects of the physiology of appetite. And it varies in strength from person to person. But it's important to stress that 
even with these super responders you see on the left hand side of the screen, these effects are rarely sustained. And before we touch on the biology of this, which we will, we'll look at what happens when we partner up diet and exercise. So when we get the combination of eat less, move more, we see additive effects. Again, lots of studies on this. And on average, in intensive randomized controlled trials, people lose about 7% of their weight. And 1% to 2% of this is as a result of exercise, specifically if it's aerobic exercise. But what we always have to remember is RCTs are not the real world. And I think anyone who's done research and then seen patients in clinic trying to implement the same methodology, we see a translational gap. So where the uh, lifestyle interventions proven in RCTs are examined at primary care level, meta-analysis show about two kilograms of weight loss at one year. In the United States, the diabetes prevention program, it hit 7% weight loss in its RCT. It was 4% in, in the real world, not 12 months. But what we have to keep in mind is even in intensive randomized controlled trials, lots of resources, lots of time, we see this same trend again and again. This is one or CT out of many, but I chose it. It's particularly interesting because it compared the effects of rapid versus gradual weight loss on long-term outcomes at three years. And what we see in this particular study is two groups of people. One group lost 15% of their weight over 12 weeks. The other group uh, over 36 weeks, eating less, moving more. And what we see on this graph is at three years follow up, 66% of the weight had been regained. And it's important to remember that these participants were not just left to their own devices. The investigators were doing their best. Everyone was doing their best to keep the uh, initial effect sustained. So what happens when we look further into the future? On average, 80% of the weight is regained after five years. This is not due to people being lazy. So what we have to think about is what led to these, the, the obesity emerging in the first place. We've heard this already this morning. It's an interaction of genes with the environment, and there are many causal factors in the environment we don't fully appreciate. But what caused the weight regain after the initial weight loss was adaptive responses taking place in the exact same environment that caused the obesity in the first place. So biology has played a huge role. And this is, again, where we have to differentiate between weight, weight loss and treating obesity, because if we successfully treat and control obesity, we should naturally see clinically significant long-term weight outcomes. We see that with very few people with lifestyle. This does not mean lifestyle therapy alone is useless. It just means for the majority, it's not enough. And we need to stop shaming patients uh, for not responding in the short and long term. Instead, we need to appreciate the biology at play. So we'll look at the biology now. So uh, we'll think about what happens with exercise alone. So obviously, there's this deeply held belief that body weight regulation can be reduced to simple mathematics. And the reality is the physiology governing appetite and body weight regulation is extremely complex. So why we see um, such limited weight loss and effects with expenditure of thousands of calories with uh, why do we see, should I say, so, such little weight loss when we give people so much exercise and so much expenditure of energy? So research pioneered by Professor John Blundell at the University of Leeds what he has shown us is that the greatest predictor of how hungry we feel and how much energy we consume is energy expenditure. So that's our resting metabolic rate, our non-exercise associated thermogenesis, and our physical activity energy expenditure. If you turn those up, you are turning up the drive to eat. And often it's in direct proportion. And this is, makes evolutionary sense. Another reason for limited weight loss is that energy expenditure appears to be physiologically constrained. So Herman Ponzer, um, Duke University in the United States, he's done really good research on the hunter-gatherer had the tribe of Tanzania. And what he and his team found challenges this additive energy expenditure model that you can just you know, reduce this to algebra, keep moving and you're gonna lose weight. And what they found was that hunter-gatherers with varying degrees of activity um, you know, very active, some more than others, they were all maintaining similar total daily energy expenditure when they looked at this through doubly level water. Their body was compensating. 
This is likely an evolutionary adaptation deeply constrained across species. But then this does happen. Why do we see some people lose a lot of weight with high volume exercise? It's extremely rare. Uh, but what is happening is biological. But we're now beginning to understand is that muscle is not a boring tissue we once thought it was. In response to muscle contraction, muscle work, we see a lot of proteins produced called myokines. And these biomolecules, they interact with the muscle itself. And there's also evidence to suggest that these proteins are both indirectly and directly acting on the brain to suppress appetite and also maybe to promote appetite in the short term potentially the long term. But I need to stress that this response is very far from common and uh, it does not justify calling exercise a treatment for obesity. So what about long term biological responses? So we've heard a little bit about weight regain today, but we'll go a little bit into the biology of why it happens. So leptin is a hormone produced by the fat cell and it signals to the brain long term energy storage. If you're born without leptin, not being produced by the adipocyte or your leptin receptor is not working in your brain, you're going to be profoundly hungry all the time and you'll be living with severe obesity. This is rare. What is not rare is that with weight loss, leptin is reduced and it is thought to be signaling to the brain to reduce energy expenditure via interactions with the sympathetic nervous system. And, um, you know, what we see here is a uh, metabolic adaptation for the given amount of fat free mass or lean tissue someone has after weight loss you see less energy expenditure than you'd expect and this is coupled with an increased drive to eat so to look at the under the hood at what is causing this increased drive to eat this is a, a study with people with obesity they underwent intensive eat less move more for 10 weeks they lost around 10 percent of their body weight and what investigators did was they examined baseline 10 week and 62 week appetite hormone levels and body weight. And uh, what they found was obviously, well, it's obvious at this stage, I think in the story is a substantial amount of weight regain. Uh, and they also found that ghrelin levels uh, were persistently higher. So this signals to the brain hunger. They saw PYY, amylin and CCK levels were persistently lower. So not only were these hormone levels lower, or altered, should I say, the perception of appetite was also shifted. So yet another biological response, we think causally involved in weight regain. So this Donald talked about the narrative and the story and in, in society that this is all willpower. And people reject that this is a disease and say the solution, eat less, move more. But because um, the biology is occurring in a very subterranean part of the brain, like the hypothalamus, this is where the activity of neurons cannot be influenced by willpower. And for most people, exercise alone is not having durable mechanistic effects, allowing it to be characterized as treatment. But if we continue with this exercise for weight loss idea, we are causing harm because it's fostering unsustainable exercise prescriptions. It's leading to aversions to exercise. People are not going to want to do it simply because it's so uncomfortable. And when it doesn't work, if someone hears the message that exercise is the solution and it doesn't work, they're left feeling with a sense of personal failure. But if we go beyond weight for a moment and think about health, uh, you know, this is old news, but physical activity and exercise provide significant uh, benefits that are not only in a prevention context, but also for people living with chronic diseases. And the evidence is so strong now for exercise therapy and chronic disease that the American College of Sports Medicine and the World Health Organization, they're pushing now for exercise prescription in relation to therapeutic relief from every disease under the sun, basically. Um, before we think about how that might look in obesity, I want us just to highlight cases where exercise therapy can directly target underlying disease states or pathophysiology in a manner that warrants calling it a disease modifying tool. So an obvious one is osteoporosis. We use resistance training, we load the bone, we change mo bone mineral density. In type two diabetes in some people, we can see that different types of exercise has a favorable effect on glycemic control. Same at hypertension, we see with different types of exercise, improvements in vascular health. Exercise always plays a supporting role though. It's never the be all end all. 
But in terms of directly targeting biology, we cannot say this for most diseases. So cancer is an example. We've got absolutely no RCT data in humans that when someone's being diagnosed with cancer, that exercise is going to directly target the pathophysiology. But what it can do with cancer is we can use exercise to support the patient um, undergoing the treatment and address the functional issues that emerge. So if we think about what these functional issues are, they appear in every chronic disease. So it's a reduction in cardiorespiratory fitness, the VO2 max, reduction in muscle mass and muscle strength, reduction of functional ability, reduction in quality of life. And the consequence of not addressing those complications is frailty and frailty accelerates and people cross over into a disability threshold earlier. So we should be thinking about prescribing exercise and using it therapeutically to help our patients with obesity to live well and age well by reducing the risk of crossing over this disability threshold. And where a patient has crossed the disability threshold and they're with us, it becomes rehabilitation and optimizing quality of life. It doesn't matter if someone's being prescribed nutrition therapy, pharmacotherapy or bariatric surgery, this should be the focus. So the final stop in this presentation is to peer into the future and think about how it might look. Um, before doing that, I think it's really important to remember that the state of healthcare for people with obesity is not good in Ireland. Patients are often left very confused about what help they should be seeking and when. Too often people will try the eat less, move more approach given to them by people with very unscientific views. And if it doesn't work, they're made feel responsible, a failure, and desperate for help. And they'll most likely try it in a different flavor and get the same result. And it's because of this lack of understanding or appreciation that this is a disease we're treating. Um, you know, when people seek help from a doctor, they're still often given outdated advice and shame, you know, Professor O'Shea and Dr. Crotty, you know, there's not enough people like that in Ireland or in the world that understand this disease. And often with medications, they're inaccessible, not affordable. The same goes for bariatric surgery. This will change, but we just need to realize that it's still not good at the moment for people. But I am very optimistic about the future. I think inevitably what's going to happen is the science of obesity is going to make its way into curriculums. I think we're going to see medical doctors, physios, dietitians, exercise physiologists, PTs, exercise uh, or SNC coaches, you know, appreciating the difference between how we've looked at weight loss in the past and how we need to look at obesity treatment. And in the case of obesity treatment, I think we're going to see the model of care evolve. And instead of eat less, move more as this kind of base therapy, we're going to have these more holistic, personalized interventions that aim to address potential underlying modifiable causal factors driving the obesity. This will include nutrition therapy, focusing on healthy meal patterns and dietary constituents instead of restriction. It will focus on um, healthy sleep patterns, stress management, examine, examination of potential weight promoting medications and exercise therapy used for the purpose of health optimization. And where people don't respond to these kind of 360 interventions, they're not going to be shamed or blamed. Instead, they're going to get escalated to safe and effective treatments such as pharmacotherapy or surgery. And in some cases, people will just start on pharmacotherapy and surgery immediately. In this context, again, exercise therapy, it's playing a strong supporting role to promote health, but also to, um, uh, to address potential emergent therapeutic needs. Because what we don't have the full picture with at the moment is the loss of skeletal muscle with pharmacotherapy and surgery. Now, I personally think it's a totally overhyped um, story in the media at the moment, but there are individuals potentially at risk? And there's also fatigue issues with substantial weight loss, et cetera. So it's beyond the scope of this presentation, obviously, to go into the details on exercise prescription. But from a high level, this is how I think exercise will be implemented on the ground in the future. Um, you can see there's five ones there that should read one through to five. But um, first of all, exercise and rehabilitation specialists are going to be educated uh, and skilled to change the narrative with patients. 
to take the lead on changing the narrative and reframing the experience. And this starts with understanding science. Um, there's going to be an appreciation that no two patients are alike. Um, there can be immense inter-individual differences because of comorbidities, complications, and this means a battery of testing is going to be standard um, before patients get started. And when it comes to the actual um, prescription of the exercise, the principles won't change. You know, it's going to be about prescribing the right dose to elicit the desired physiological response. But one thing is for sure, this idea of unpalatable exercise is going to go out the window. Um, and the aim will be, you know, to help upskill the patient for long term self care. And this is going to mean continuity of a variety of approaches uh, at home in the local gym and outdoors. And what I think I know this, there potentially is some exercise specialists listening to this. I think that because you're going to reframe your job away from chasing kilograms of weight loss, you're going to enjoy your job more and patients are going to look forward to seeing you. So um, that brings my presentation to an end. I just want to say that the images you see in this deck, they're from the ICPO Image Bank. And um, I really strongly encourage everyone just, you know, who is interested to look at the Association for the Study of Obesity on the Island of Ireland, the, the guidelines adapted from Canada. Um, you know, the, there's a tremendous amount in there and there's, you know, more to deep dive on from the perspective of uh, exercise therapy. So thank you very much.